Hi, guys and girls. This is Bjorkman from Audio Issues. We are here with mastering engineer Ian Shepard of Production Advice. He recently reopened the doors to the very popular home mastering master class, so I thought I'd grab him for a second round of interviews to discuss all things mastering. Ian, welcome. Thanks, Bjorkman. Glad to be here. Um, most of my readers should be familiar with you. I uh, posted the old interview we did in early summer this week. But uh, for those that are unfamiliar, uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, production advice, and uh, the Home Mastering Masterclass? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm uh, a mastering engineer, a DVD author, recording engineer, producer, but mastering is my speciality. I've been doing it for about 15, more than 15 years now. I keep saying 15 years, but the time goes by. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I have my own company, Mastering Media, where I do that. But I also run the production advice website, which uh, is just aiming to help people get better results uh, recording, mixing and mastering their music. And especially lately, people are really interested in the mastering side of things. So I've been doing more about that. And that's why I started the Home Mastering Masterclass, which is a it's an eight week. Actually, it's a nine week course with the. I added an extra week in when we ran it for the first time um, where people get to watch videos of me mastering different songs using different software and I talk about what I'm doing and they can ask questions and I answer them in podcasts that we do every week which everybody gets to to listen to and yeah it's it's been really successful I've had great feedback from everybody who's done it really enjoyed doing the course and um, yeah so I wanted to open it up so that more people can get the chance. That was, that's just the reason that you had people on uh, that wanted to take the course and didn't get a chance the first time around? Is that why you opened it up again? Or is there more to it? It was partly a timing issue um, because uh, I wanted to get the course finished before Christmas arrives. Um, and I knew that I, I think I'm unlikely to have time to run it early next year. So that would have meant if I didn't run it, it it's a bit sooner than maybe I would have chosen ideally. But uh, if I had left it, it could have been months and months. Um, and I already had maybe 150 people on the waiting list mm -hmm. wanting to get wanting to get in. So um, yeah, it just seemed like it was a kind of now or never type thing. Right. And you need time to do the Bob the Builder for, for Christmas again, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be lucky enough to do that again this year. But uh, Bob's been pretty quiet recently. Yeah. Well, for those that didn't get that, that's the inside joke from the, the other interview. Um, how did people, uh, is it, is it any different this time around? Are you doing extra Q and A's or videos? Any extra additional videos? Yeah. All the Q and A's are new. Okay. So, um, I mean, I have archives of the original Q and A's. I, I kind of thought about this. I thought about just letting people, cause there's also a database of the questions that got asked the first time round. Mm -hmm. And I thought people could kind of read through those and maybe find the answers to the questions they wanted. But I think people really liked the direct connection, um, of sending me emails and, and me answering their questions and everybody had different questions and they all come from slightly different angles that worked really well. So I thought I would do that again. So that part is, is new. And yes, I have several new videos planned um, to kind of answer some of the frequently asked questions from the previous course. Got hold of a few different bits of software since uh, we did the course originally that people were asking about. So I'll be able to give some opinions on those as well. Oh, okay, great, great. I didn't notice this the first time around, but the, uh, until later on in the course that you also have a Facebook group that's very active. Yeah, absolutely. I've um, I've kind of added that to the the information page about the course now to make it more of a feature because that was kind of a last minute thing that I added in. Um, I didn't kind of make it a big selling point last time, but it it has been great. You know, I don't um, I don't guarantee to answer everybody's questions there, but what's good is that I mean, already we have there's uh, a bunch of people who've signed up for this new course, and they're already talking to people who did the course last time and getting some answers and some feedback from them. So um, yeah, it's you know really good high quality uh, conversations. Uh, what's the, the phrase? High signal to noise ratio. You know, the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not like uh, <laughs> to be nerdy about it. <laughs> exa exactly. Yeah, it's you know there's uh, well come on, this is for mastering engineers. You have to be. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be quite nerdy to want to do this. <laughs> this is true. I can I can relate. I can relate. Um, one of the last videos you did was the one that um, you deemed had more problems than the 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 former ones. How did people react to that bonus video with the song that needed a little extra work? Well, people really loved it. Um, it was 
yeah, that, that kind of came up as the course went on. Before the course started, I had planned out, I'd found eight different songs that I wanted to, to master. I had eight different kind of topics to cover in each video. And I had talked to the people and I had interviewed the people who did it. And the interviews are part of the course as well. I, I got quite a few emails from people saying, this is great, but all of this stuff is actually pretty high quality. Mm -hmm. um, because you're right, nobody wants to put their worst work in to a kind of public arena where everybody's going to listen to, you know, exactly. listen to their, their disasters. Um, <laughs> so basically, you know, I, I just invited people on the, the course the first time around to send me songs that they thought needed more work mm -hmm. than the examples that I was doing. And I would do a bonus video where I would master that uh, or one, one of those, one that I chose. And uh, yeah, I did it and people people loved it. The, the song for the first course was by a guy called Rich Fluke. I think he was slightly embarrassed about some of the, <laughs> the comments that I made about the song. But I think everybody learned a lot. And, in, you know, you got to see what mastering can do when it's kind of really digging in there and, and making more dramatic changes. And uh, I'm, so I'm going to do that again this time as well. I'm going to let people doing the course have that original video, but I'm also going to ask people on the course this time to send in their, their songs and I will pick another one and do another bonus video with the, with the whole same idea in mind. Okay, okay. Um, we talked a little bit about metering last time. Uh, I wanted to ask you some ask you about some advice on setting up a good monitoring and a listening system. Yeah, that's, that's a tough one because one of the advantages of going to a professional mastering studio is you get access to probably a very expensive monitoring setup, a very well-treated room acoustically, and it's also different from the one that you've been recording on so you get a different perspective and that's a that's really hard to do in a home studio or a project studio you know even people who have really sexy recording studios at home or in available to them probably don't have a whole other set of premises where they can set up a, a dedicated mastering room yeah. so there's kind of various challenges in that i mean the first one is you know if you're listening to what you've just mixed I'm thinking how am I going to master this? You're listening on the same setup as you were before. So any issues you might have with your setup are still going to be there. Definitely. So you're, they're not going to, you're not going to hear anything different. One of the things I suggest in the course is getting a really high pair, high quality pair of headphones mm. um, to give you an alternative perspective. Another thing people can do is use hi-fi systems. If you know, if they have a, a decent hi-fi in their lounge that they're really used to listening to, mm. or even a good car stereo or whatever, you can get some different perspectives that way. Is that what you're getting at? Or are you actually talking about how to set things up better? Well, just a little bit of both, I would assume. But um, one of the things, would you do the? Would you be doing the listening on the hi-fi system after your mix or after your mastering? It depends. Um, probably the easiest is to go and do because I mean, don't get me wrong. Part of the whole idea of the course is to show people what. The, the mindset of mastering. So even though they're listening on the same system that they recorded on, and even though that may not be a, a, an ideal monitoring environment, there are still loads of valuable things that you can do as part of the mastering process. And once you start, part of the course is introducing people to these rules that were told to me when I first started mastering about kind of rules of thumb, guidelines, if you like, to help you get great results. And if you start following those and understanding why they work, what you find is that you start hearing all kinds of stuff that you didn't hear when you were mixing. So that works anyway. But if somebody is, one thing that you could do, maybe if you're doing all your mastering in the box, then you could maybe get a laptop and sit in your lounge and master in there, you know, sit in your favorite chair where you listen to all your other music. That's going to give you a great perspective. And then you have to take it out and try it on other systems and see whether that works. If that's not an option, then yeah, mastering in the studio and then burning a CD or putting on a USB stick or whatever, however you're going to do it, and just you know, maybe put it on an iPod, plug it into the hi-fi and listen to it there. And that's what I'm doing here because um, the whole course I'm doing in my own home studio, you know, I'm doing it as the people who are doing the course are going to be doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm mastering, I mean, for the purposes of the videos, I'm actually mastering on headphones using the, the built-in audio on my Mac Pro, uh -huh. which is not, not an ideal situation, but it's, it's good enough to... Yeah. yeah, it's good to relay the information that way. Yeah, well, it means that I'm... And I mean, I, it's, I said as part of the course on one of the Q&As, it's interesting because I've realized, I'm remembering when I first started training as a mastering engineer, I would... I was working in a great studio on great monitors, but I would still go into other rooms 
uh, the other engineers worked in uh, in the company where I worked and listen to it there and get different perspectives and go back and make adjustments. And that was part of the learning process. And now I'm kind of going through that same process doing these videos for people that the people doing the course are going to have to go through. So what I'm finding is, you know, I'm used now to when I master in the studio, I go in, I do the job. Maybe there's some tiny little tweaks, nothing major. And whereas when I'm working at home, what I find is not surprisingly, I do what I think is a great job on the headphones. I take it down and plug it into the hi-fi and immediately four or five problems leap out <laughs> at me. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going downstairs with a, you know, a, a notepad and making notes and saying, okay, more this one. Blah, blah. Then I go back upstairs, listen again on the headphones. And usually I can then suddenly hear this problem that didn't, I hadn't noticed before. Yeah. And then I can make some changes and then I go back to the speakers and probably that time it's a lot better if not, if not right. Um, and as time goes on, that's how you learn what you're mastering monitoring is really telling you what what your monitoring is really telling you and with the addition of the rules and the guidelines on levels and metering and uh, you know how to use all the processing and stuff that's when everything kind of starts to click and you, you start getting better results right right the last time through did you notice any specific trends or any common questions that were asked in the q and a's like over and over again everybody wanted to know what my favorite plugins were <laughs> <laughs> okay i can understand that you know people are they, they want to have they, they want to they want to know that what they're what they have or what they're going to get is good enough and so i try and give some feedback on that i'm kind of getting closer to having some some definite opinions on that mm. um which i'm sure i will uh share with uh people on the course this time but yeah th those are common problem uh, questions Lots of questions about the differences between floating point and fixed point okay. processing. You know, whether it's safe to let levels peak inside your door, mm. uh, you know, let, let levels go above zero, which is possible in a 32-bit floating point system. Quite a lot of questions about this, kind of the, the techie details like dither, s setting EQ and compression settings. Those, those were the kind of t topics that kept coming around. Right, right, right. Yeah, one of the things I noticed in the course is uh, how you do kind of broad boosts and very, sometimes very subtle. Um, do you ever use a narrow cue in your EQs to get like surgical? I try not really narrow, usually. I mean, I say that. I did have a track that I mastered while I was doing the course last time where the guy had recorded the vocal in a virtual almost a cubicle room um which you probably know is like the worst possible shape yeah, yeah. And, it, and it had it had some really serious resonances so i actually went in there and i had maybe four or five i got him to give me stems i got him to give me the vocals separately from the, the backing and then i had four or five really narrow eqs basically cutting out the harmonics that were being amplified in the room really severely like 10 or 12 db cuts yeah and what amazed me is it worked. Um, yeah, it, it still didn't sound superb, but it sounded a load better than it had done. Yeah. But I mean, that tends to be fairly rare. You sometimes for if you have like a kind of boomy resonance in a kick drum or in a vocal, quite often, then I'll use a narrower cue. I try to avoid them because the narrower the go, you go, the more audible the cut is. And if you're working on a whole stereo mix, then you don't want to make um, an adjustment for the sake of the vocal and have it cut out the guitar right. tone as well. You know, it's, but yeah, I, I do use them when, when they're necessary, you know. In fact, I think I use some fairly narrow boosts and cuts in the bonus video from memory l last time. So it'll be interesting to see what comes up this time. Okay. All right. Um, a lot of my readers ask me questions about muddiness, and this is across the board. This is also in mixing, but also in mastering. What's a good way to reduce? like muddiness or boominess in a song? The, the, the common answer to this is to high pass filter to cut all the bass out. And that's not the answer that I usually give. You need to listen to each element in the mix individually. You need, it needs to be done at the mixing stage, really. Mm -hmm. You can sometimes do it at the mastering stage. I mean, for example, if you're tracking, you know, vocals and guitar and um, maybe some percussion or something all in the same room, quite a lot of the muddiness will come from the resonances of the room. Mm -hmm. And if they build up over multiple tracks in a mix, that's when it can start to cause a kind of real build up. Okay. Um, in that situation, a general cut at the mastering stage can actually quite often fix it 
because you're basically you know taking out a similar area on all the all the tracks right. but if maybe the, the there's some boominess in the bass or some some th- thickness in the bass guitar and something in the vocal and something in the electric guitars and stuff or in a piano sound and they're all a bit different that approach is less successful i mean i do think that's the kind of thing you can address at mastering you kind of i i know that people have been amazed by what i have done for them when i'm mastering their stuff yeah. and and they're, they're like well, what did you do and i'm just well i just did a bit of a cut here and some lift up there yeah. my perspective on it and my experience helped me make those decisions for them that they couldn't see when they were doing it themselves. And it kind of seemed sort of magical to them, but actually, you know, probably they could have done it themselves. <laughs> but I mean, that's, you know, it's just the experience, right? Yeah. It's experience doing it day in, day out, having, being in that mindset. I mean, I think that's, you know, again, one of the important things that the course teaches you is, is what the mindset is with mastering, what you're trying to achieve, how you get there. And then just balancing these songs against each other. Um, I can't remember who it is. I used the the quote in the, the trailer video that I put on my website. Um, somebody said it, it was working. You know, they were following the kind of process and suddenly they were hearing all kinds of stuff they'd never heard before. They were noticing all these things and, it, you know, it was stuff that they'd wanted to do for years and had never managed to do. And suddenly it was kind of happening for them. And it made me realize how good my training was because it's great. I kind of... Yeah, I mean, I kind of always tended to take it as uh, take it for red that, <laughs> that that you could do these things in mastering. And now I realise, I mean, I've got a lot of experience. I've spent a lot of time doing it, but it's also because w- when you follow this kind of process to to get there, oh. it kind of comes out naturally. But just to go back to the original question, in terms of getting muddiness out of a mix, it's all about balance. It's all about listening to the individual components of the mix and thinking, well. In, does that sound muddy in any kind of way? And I would use gentle parametrics to just dip it out. Mm-hmm. So quite often that that kind of muddy sound is anywhere between 100 and 500 hertz, yeah. depending on what the instrument is and, and all the rest of it. So it's a question of listening carefully to each element of the mix. And and I would say not getting too extreme with the, the frequency carving. You know, you, you see quite often advice to people to boost one instrument in one place and cut another one in another. Mm-hmm. That is a useful technique, but if you go too far, you end up with a load of stuff that just doesn't sit together and doesn't gel. Yeah, I think it's just paying attention throughout the process. And then hopefully there's not too much left to be dealt with at the mastering stage. Right. Sometimes you actually don't need to boost the other. You just need to cut the one. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's uh, Well, and if you've got a good ar- arrangement, if, if, if there aren't any instruments kind of fighting each other in the mix to begin with, then you can just make each, each, each instrument sound good and balance the levels against each other and it's going to work. In mastering, if you've got a muddy mix, it's a it's a question of pinpointing the right frequency and either cutting a little bit at that point or boosting somewhere else to, to kind of balance it. Sure. Here's another big question that everybody likes to ask. Uh, why EQ before compression when you're mastering? You don't have to, but I do, and I advise people to to. And I think it's because... The compression is is the control in mastering. You know, uh, mastering is about setting the levels, setting the EQ, and then choosing how the dynamics are going to work, how compressed your overall sound is going to be, and and how each track balances against the other. Mm. So if you set up all of your compression and then put some EQ in, you're changing those dynamic decisions. It's it's the way I've always done it. It's the way I was taught. It seems logical to me. Another particular reason for the way that I do it is that it enables you to, I mean, I quite often use multiband compression when yeah. I'm mastering, not all the time, but but quite often. People are always asking, how do you change the settings within the bands and all the rest of it? And actually, the truth is, if you get the EQ right going in, you don't have to worry so much about the, the individual thresholds mm. of the different bands. And you're almost using the EQ as a, oh, if you think about it, if you push, a, if you add a load of 100 hertz, to the signal and you've got a multiband compressor that goes has a crossover at 160 hertz then by pushing up that low signal you're basically lifting the level of that band mm-hmm. up into the compressor so you're determining how much compression happens by using the eq but the control that the eq gives you is much more precise than just winding the threshold down if you just wind down the threshold uh, everywhere below 160 hertz that's like adding a shelving eq right Right. but you could go in with a parametric quite a narrow parametric and just boost one frequency in the kick drum or you could do a notch in one place and a boost in another so you can shape the frequency going into the compressor 
And then you can do that in three different bands, and suddenly you've got a huge amount of control over the signal. I do occasionally use EQ after compression. I never use it. I always have a limiter or some kind of, you know, peak level control at the end of the chain. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of an example of why I would use it specifically after a compressor. I guess if you think about, let's say, a you have a very boomy kick drum in a mix. Mm -hmm. Every time that boomy kick drum comes through, it's going to trigger gain reduction in the compressor. Okay? So you're going to hear a bit of pumping in the compressor. Sure. If you use some EQ to correct for that before the compressor, that won't happen. The compressor, you even out the EQ going in so that it's not booming anymore, then the compressor will react consistently whatever the bottom end is doing. If you EQ that boom out after the compressor, it will still work, but the pumping caused by the compression will already have happened. Mm. So you'll be left with a sound that has that pumping in there. Sometimes you want that. Right. Right. Um, and in that's a case where you might choose to use the EQ afterwards. But usually, mastering is all about making the changes in a way that people can't tell. People don't notice. It's about almost being invisible. Yeah. You know, it, it sounds better and nobody knows why. And that's about <laughs> doing things in the most subtle way possible and the, the, uh, the most minimalist way possible. So in that case, for me, getting the EQ right going in is, is the right way to go. Okay, okay. Um David from Italy asks, and this, I don't know, this might be more of a mixing question, uh, on your take on audio panning. <laughs> I've got a, a blog post uh, that's pretty uh, controversial uh, called um, LCR Panning Sucks. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, which is the, you know, <laughs> LCR is, is left, center, right panning, which is this kind of style of panning that was mm. stems from back in the days where mixers didn't have pan pots. Right. Um, you know, when the, the early EMI desks that the Beatles worked on didn't have that ability to pan things around the, the stereo image. Uh, Mixer Man, in particular, uh, really likes LCR panning and recommends that everybody does it. And Chris Lord Olage, too. Yep, absolutely. He's, he's a big fan of it. Yeah. Now, what those guys don't tell you, they're not doing it exclusively, you know? Mm. It's a great way to get started. Um, I would certainly encourage people to do more panning rather than less, mm -hmm. at least to begin with. Um, and, you know, doing something like putting... Uh, I don't know, two rhythm guitars, hard right and hard left, or panning the cymbals right out to get a wide drum spread or that kind of stuff is great. I'd certainly go along with that. But if you just do LCR panning, which is what some people think those guys are saying, you end up with this kind of polarized mix, you know, mm -hmm. where there's a load of, there's this kind of cluster of stuff in the middle mm -hmm. and then stuff going around in the edges and then kind of huge gaps else, everywhere else. So, uh, my take on panning is is use lots of it. I'm not a big fan of, of kind of mostly mono mixes, personally. I know that, uh, I forget his name, the engineer who does the chili peppers loves to basically mix in mono. And I'm not a big fan of, of that sound. But you can't go too extreme. So it's for me, it's all about finding a little place in the stereo image for everything. So, you know, you do bass, drums, vocals in the center, obviously. Um, and then a nice wide image on the drums and maybe any kind of stereo keyboards or anything you've got. Sure. And then it's about kind of finding places to slot everything in. Right. That's another place where headphones can be useful. You know, if you've got really good monitors and really good imaging, then you can make those decisions on speakers. But it's good then to, to stick on a really good pair of headphones and get an alternative perspective because you can kind of really focus on where those things are. And one thing I like about that is that, for me personally, I try to have a slightly different pan position for everything. So not for the stuff that's in the center, right. but you know, let's let's say you've got two mono percussion instruments and they're both panned over to the left, say shaker and a cowbell or something. Sure, sure. I wouldn't put both of those bang at two o'clock, twenty percent left, or however it is that it's marked. Mm -hmm. I would always put them slightly separate, and because another thing is that's another way of getting separation without having to carve out the EQ. Right. You know, if you've got two instruments that are in a playing in a similar frequency range, put them on either side of the stereo image. Maybe not the extreme right and left, but, you know, mm -hmm. two o'clock and whatever the other side of two. <laughs> <laughs> ten o'clock. Ten o'clock. Two, 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 yeah, two, two and ten, like driving. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, so, so that they can balance each other. They each have their own space within stereo image. Mixer Man is not going to agree with that, and he actually weighed in on the comments of the blog post that I did, and we, we had a good conversation about it. And it, it can go on and on. I mean, it's, it's what works. But I would say, you know, be bold with your panning, but don't go too extreme. All right. All right. Um, another question from a reader. He asking about your preference of hardware and software, EQ, compression, and reverb, and, and, and the like. 
I know you use just in the box in the home mastering masterclass, but do you have a preference of using outboards? Well, my outboard processing of choice is TC Electronics, uh, the System 6000, which is a beautiful hardware unit with a touch-sensitive screen and all this stuff. But that's digital. And actually, those similar algorithms, not exactly the same, are available as plugins if you've got a, a power core audio card. So... I think it's a bit of a red herring, to be honest. You know, I I really like using uh, nice analog hardware EQ when it's available, and sometimes it's it's just what something needs. But you can get great results in the box as well. I think people spend too much time agonising about what they're using and not how they use it. You know, if if you have a song and it needs a two dB notch at hundred hertz with a Q of one point five and a broad boost up at three and a half K. Um, and a you know gentle roll off uh, up at 16 kilohertz even if each of those changes is only a few dbs the benefits of doing that with either an analog eq or a digital eq or any other eq will be far greater than spending hours agonizing over which of those things to use mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Does, that, does that make sense it's yeah. i mean if you've got a room full of beautiful hardware and you know that this song needs 3 dBs at 60 hertz and you know a cut somewhere else right. by all means set it up on four or five different EQs and listen to each one and decide which one's best mm-hmm. um, it's a paradise situation right there well it's a, it's a paradise situation and it's kind of you know I prefer to know one tool really well and use it really effectively you know I mean I, I worked as a professional engineer for 15 years for another company and they had maybe a choice of four or five EQs mm-hmm. and I used the, the, the TC most of the time, like 90% of the time. And the customers are very happy. By all means, make those choices if you've got them available, but it's it's more about making the right decisions than what you use to do them. Cool. Um, well, thanks. Uh, that's that's all my questions. Um, really appreciate taking the time to uh, come talk to me. I, I know we had some time zone issues, but I think we resolved them pretty well. <laughs> yep, we seem to we seem to one on that. That's all right. It's, it's a pleasure. It's, it's really nice to to talk to you again. Um, I should just tell people that if they're interested in the course, uh, the, there's an introductory offer on it, which ends on Friday. The course starts on Friday, mm-hmm. um, and at that point, the price goes up. Um, so if they're interested, get in now. There's a full money back guarantee. So if they decide later that it's not right for them, then I'm very happy to, to refund them their money. Well, there's a huge amount of value in that. I loved it the first time through. Excellent. That's exactly what I want to hear. I mean, you know, that's, I mean, it's interesting because I, I, I said this when I was talking to somebody else, you know, I mean, it's, it's called the Home Mastering Masterclass. And that's uh, because, you know, I'm not going to pretend that you will get exactly the same results in your home studio as if you go to one of the top flight engineers in the world and one of the best facilities in the world. But the advice uh, that I'm giving is the same that I would give you if you had a real mastering studio to use. If people, I mean, I know that some people who did the course last time uh, were setting up, you know, they were asking my advice on what to get in terms of monitoring and how to get things set up well mm-hmm. and all the rest of it. Um, so, you know, it, I'm not dumbing this down in any way for anybody. You know, I give completely honest answers and as much information as I can to any of the questions people want to ask. So, you know, it's... It's aimed at people who are home mastering, but it's it's their pro mastering techniques. All right, thanks a lot. Cool, thanks, Bevin.